a slim margin kind of separates Superman from Blue Beetle. This has been my most anticipated superhero movie all year. There was a lot going against this movie. Is it just the hardcore fans that are going to go see Blue Beetle? We made a movie and someone said it was good. <laughs> I'd be yes. jumping through the room. <laughs> Welcome to Backseat Directing. Where we talk about movies, TV shows, comics, and more. We're your hosts, Andrew and Aaron. And we put out new episodes every Monday and Thursday. And on this episode, we're doing a movie review on Blue Beetle. Three, two, one. Action. The most like quotable line that sticks in my head from this podcast is you going, Oh shit. What is Oh Oh let's go. go. Just kicks it. Oh, that was smooth. <laughs> when we're reacting to the every, trailer. Why don't you know every time you quote it, the pitch of your voice gets higher and higher each time. Yeah, I'm going to be <laughs> supersonic when you quote it. Only dogs are going to be able to hear it the next time you quote it. <laughs> voice is not that high. My it voice really, is not that high. It really was, though. <laughs> <laughs> this the the trailer reaction um, did pretty well for us. I I, I it really, did. this movie had a really good trailer. We're we're gonna go over a few things and then talk about what we thought of the movie in depth. But dang, this movie's trailer got me hyped, and I heard a lot of other positive reactions to this trailer. If this this movie is not doing the best financially, it's definitely not because of the trailer because <laughs> that that it was very the music is very memorable just the ah, 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 I yeah. Just rock. Like, yeah they they picked a great song they i think they showed a, a really great um enticing amount of stuff without showing too much if you just look at the first trailer yeah well that's with every movie yeah right and like then that. they released like that trailer the week before where they're like do you want to pay to see the movie or do you just want to watch this trailer <laughs> yeah. and you could get everything watch the movie for in three minutes <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's how it is with every trailer, though. I was in the theaters yesterday watching Blue Beetle on the commercial. That was really loud. I know. It's so loud. It's a couple of us. <laughs> but the, the trailer that came on for Gran Turismo was like showing the whole movie. And I literally just covered no. my eyes and <laughs> my ears. And I was like, I'm not watching this right now. Yeah. Because this movie looks really good. And they already showed a lot in the first trailer. Um, yeah, I think the first trailer showed the whole, like a lot of the movie, too. Yeah. All right. Before we go into the actual movie review, I want to take time to say thank you to the audience for watching and all the support. We're almost at 500 subscribers on YouTube. We're four away right now. Uh, we kind of went up and down there for a second. Like we're right up teeter tottering right at the 500 yeah, mark. If you want to help us out and you're watching this and not subscribed, like help us beat that hurdle. Or tell your friends and family if you are subscribed. Please help us out because we backslid. We were, we were like, yeah. we could taste 500. <laughs> and then something happened. We pissed somebody off. Yeah, and people left. But now they're yeah. back. Yeah. They're back at uh, at right now, 496. Uh, but last week on uh, August 15th was our one year anniversary of actually sitting down and recording our first episode. And then tomorrow, from the date of recording this, is the 23rd. And that was the first day that we posted that episode so we're right at that one year mark it's been a long journey um but at the same time it feels like it was just yesterday like it really does it feels like we just started this. it feels like it just happened yeah but um so also if you guys like have spotify or apple Podcasts, like maybe head over there and give us some love because that has not gone anywhere yeah. <laughs> over this year but everything else has been growing um we we have merch yeah we, we have, have shirts. We have a couple different options now too on our merch store. You should see a few a few things on there if you're interested in hoodie. Yeah, I, I know it's like the hottest month ever. Well, hey, not everyone. But <laughs> but it won't be hot forever. Yeah. So so when you want to get back into your style mode, that's right. <laughs> but I have a few comments here that I wanted to read. Um, you know, uh, engage with our listeners, but also like we just said, we're celebrating a year, so. Let's let's touch on some comments that we got recently. Uh, we let's see which episode is this from. So this is an old episode, actually. Our our, bro our Brokeback Mountain review. 
we well, recently a while ago yeah a while ago we got a just this comment out of nowhere that i really really liked and it it's their name is just numbers but they said very good analysis heard points not made or discussed in other video reviews which to me like that's a big compliment because when you're reviewing movies and shows on this, what you when you want to do when you're doing anything creative is differentiate yourself. But when it comes to movie and TV reviews, sometimes it feels like a lot of things have already been said. Right. So we try to repeating yeah. Yeah. what others have said in your own way. Yeah. We try and we try to like that's what ultimately what we're trying to do is have a different perspective on it. And I personally really like trying to think about movies in a different way, and I want to try to have that conversation with other people of us thinking about movies in a different light. So that I really, really appreciated that comment. Um, and then the other comments I want to talk about are most recent as of the recording, this our most recent episode to come out, um, our duos draft, where that was a lot of fun. Aaron won that, that draft in an absolute landslide. Um, I still, my team still has my vote and that's what matters <laughs> deep down. It's yeah. a moral victory. Yeah. 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 Uh, but every vote I've seen for this has been for Aaron's team. And uh, so I'll give him that congratulations. Where, Thank you. Sir. Where it's due, that was uh, very respectable of you. Of course. This, and this, so we have another comment from somebody whose name is all number. It's S41NT84. Um, they said team Aaron for the win. Uh, they, they, they go on to hype Aaron up some more, but nobody needs to hear all that. Official Cinema 3D. I read it though. Long time, long time friends of the of the show have also taken Aaron's side, you know, uh, unfortunately, but they, they promoted him for his choice of uh, Chewbacca and Han Solo, I think, and Woody and Buzz. Yep. Uh, so Aaron definitely had some good picks there. And then we got called out um, for not picking Daryl and Rick from The Walking Dead. I think two different people suggested Daryl and Rick, which is that's a great Sheesh. duo. It didn't, didn't make the list or the honorable mentions, unfortunately, but yeah. that is a great duo. So, um, Sam, my sister, actually called us out for that. And and then Trigz0140, who is also a friend of mine, called us out for uh, for not picking Naruto and Sasuke or Goku and Vegeta and try to act like it was absolutely ridiculous that I picked Gon and Killua from Hunter x Hunter over Shame there. on you. Hey, listen. I, I have the best taste so he just does, he doesn't understand yeah he's just not there yet <laughs> he'll he'll yeah, understand maybe in a few years he'll understand when he matures <laughs> <laughs> maybe when you're older buddy um, we also had uh chandler vote on instagram too chandler voted for so, you as well yeah. yeah uh so yeah you there's a lot of places to interact with us yeah uh, spotify instagram facebook any TikTok, social media platform youtube we're trying threads we're not really I don't know. We post there every once in a while. At least Treads weekly. Is, Treads has gotten like no traction. Yeah. We had and up until last weekend we had one follower on Twitter. <laughs> the, the Twitter's just the Twitter's just not used. The Twitter's like a wasteland. It's X. Oh, I'm sorry. X. I'm, that's why. Yeah, that was so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> so dumb. I, I'm not even on board with the name. That, that's how out of touch I am with X. Yeah, that was rough. All right, let's let's dive into Blue Beetle. Uh, we didn't watch the movie together, so I don't even know if you liked this at all, if it met your expectations, or if you went into it with really low expectations and it still didn't meet those. Like, I'm not really sure where you sit at this movie. I know you were really hyped from the trailer going into it. Uh, this movie's been circled on your calendar the whole year. Um, what did you think of the movie? Just kind of uh, first impressions. Yeah, so outside of Across the Spider-Verse, this has been my most anticipated superhero movie all year, obviously behind Spider-Verse. So <laughs> I feel need to say that before and after. But um, I also tempered my expectations. So I knew, even though I love the trailer, I knew to kind of bring that down a little bit. And I'd say what I said after watching this movie is this is where superhero movies should land. This should be the ideal mark for superhero movies to hit. And if it goes above this, absolutely fantastic. But I think that it was it was really good. It was enjoyable. I liked it a lot. But I do think that it's a little bit middle of the road, nothing groundbreaking. And a lot of superhero movies lately have been falling short of that. Mm -hmm. And I think like when they just made like X-Men 1, you know, back in the day, like it's a middle of the road superhero movie. It's good. It's a great viewing. It's fun at the theater. It's entertaining. You laugh. You have a good time. You you really enjoy the characters, but it's nothing super groundbreaking. And I feel like that should be par for the course. But lately it hasn't been. So I think that's gonna make some people see this movie as like a godsend. When I think if you like 
kind of temper the like the bias a little bit it's 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 good you know yes and good is good is a compliment yeah definitely but so what did you think if, of the movie if we made a movie and someone said it was good i'd be yes so much room. <laughs> if someone said it was okay i'd be all right with that too <laughs> people are, are so ready to hate on stuff so it's very nice to just hear that something's good yeah it, and i you'll hear how much i do enjoy this movie i have a lot of compliments to give for it yeah it was a let's it was a simple movie yeah. right it was just kind of you sit back relax and just have fun you know it wasn't there wasn't like any in-depth you know, uh, storytelling going on here, you yeah. know, there wasn't a real complex dynamic between the hero and the villain. Right. And I think that's probably the weakest point of the film, but I think everything else was really good. Um, to where that all kind of equals out to where it was good. Yeah. You know, and now we're, this might be a little bit of a different structure. If you've been listening to a lot of our episodes, um, normally we'll go over our personal ratings first, but since that's kind of become the bulk of, where we talk about everything, I would like for us to go over kind of the ratings, reviews, and earnings now, and yep. then talk about that. Yep. So, uh, first off, movie summary. Uh, like we kind of already kind of already touched on, it's a relatively simple story. Uh, this alien scare up chose Jaime Reyes as the, his as the host. And this scarab gave him these powers that are a lot like, um, like Green Lantern or something. He can kind of just create things that he's thinking of, uh, but it seems like it mostly has to be attached to his body in some sort of way. Um, and basically, the 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 founder of this scarab, their company, is trying to get the scarab back. Yeah, I mean that that's pretty much as detailed as it gets to simplify what blue beetle is if for anybody that might be struggling with the concept between Jaime and the scarab, I think the easiest way for me to say it is he's like a mix between venom, a character people are already familiar mm -hmm. with in the movie. And then iron man, who people are also familiar with in the movie, like iron man's nanotech suit from, right. from infinity war forward. Cause it's has all this different possibilities where it can turn into a sword or a gun or transform into what he needs in the moment. That's the Green Lantern aspect that you mentioned before. But I wouldn't necessarily call it symbiotic because the Scarab doesn't need Jaime to survive. The, the, the Scarab uses Jaime as a host, but it obviously can live on the planet without a host, whereas Venom needs a host, so it's symbiotic. It doesn't seem like it's activated without a host, though. Yeah, it's but it's, it's a piece of technology. It's, yeah. it's an AI, so in a way, it has sentience because it, it has its own original thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the nature of symbiosis is that they, I guess you can say they provide something for one another because the host is like how the it scarab lives. moves through the world. Yeah. And otherwise, it's just kind of like a paperweight. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, yeah, but not like they need each other to survive in the same way that Venom needs Eddie Brock. Right. Because it's literally dying without him. Right. Um, at least that's how they kind of showed it in the movie. Yeah. And it, it it's fully like in, in intertwined with him. That's what I'm trying to say. Because yeah. it's, it's basically like in his DNA. It's connected to his spinal cord. It is connecting to like his, the neurons in his brain, I think they say at one point mm -hmm. in the movie. So they are intertwined as one, the scarab or, or Kaiji and Jaime. Yes. Uh, this movie came out in 2023. It's rated PG-13. It's two hours and seven minutes long. IMDb has it rated at a 6.8 out of 10. Rotten Tomatoes uh, for the audience, or sorry, for the critics has it at a 76. The audience has it at a 92%. And then the budget for this film is an estimated $120 million. And it's been, what, one week? Since it came out, it just came out last weekend. Um, so it's so been a couple just days. under a week, and it's brought in, uh, according to IMDb, forty three point six million dollars. Yeah, I, I'm sure they were looking for a little bit bigger. I'm sure they were looking for a bigger opening weekend. Well, all that I've seen in the last few weeks is that this movie's going to bring in no money. This movie's they're per project like warner brothers is projecting this movie to bring in like 17 million dollars opening weekend it's going to be their lowest opening movie blah, blah blah like i feel like they were almost like putting out this narrative that this movie wasn't going to work you know so like now that i see that it's 43 i feel like that's pretty decent for the expectation yeah yeah you know i mean we'll see how it performs on upcoming weekends 
like obviously it's it's competing in theaters with Barbie's still number Barbie was number two this weekend mm -hmm. and Barbie's been in theaters for five weeks yeah so it's it's not doing anything like that kind of success and it has a lot to compete with with Barbie and Oppenheimer still like coming out on top like for example Mission Impossible has been in theaters for six weeks and I think it came in ninth or tenth so yeah. the life that Oppenheimer and Barbie are having at the theaters is absolutely insane and it's kind of like affecting everything else that comes out um, people aren't just choosing to see Blue Beetle they're should I see Blue Beetle or should I see Barbie a second yeah, time? Yeah, well, like, out of this $43.6 million, is that all the invested comic book fans? And now everyone else is just not going to go see it? Yeah, because the thing about Blue Beetle, which I'll get more into when we do our source code, is Blue Beetle, the original character, came out in 1939, which is one year after Superman came out. So, you, like, you got to think a slim margin kind of separates Superman from Blue Beetle, and Shazam came out the same year, 1939. So like, even they're a year later, and and so is Batman. Batman's a year later, 1939. So between those four, Batman and Superman have life. They have guaranteed success at the box office. Shazam and Blue Beetle did not. Shazam had like one of the worst superhero box office for Shazam 2 in history. So is it just the hardcore fans that are going to go see Blue Beetle? And like you said, and is it done? Yeah, it, there, there was a lot going against this movie. You know, with the whole restructure of DC, we've talked about it nonstop on yeah. this podcast. There's strikes going on right now. And then, yeah, so like they, they can't market this movie. Uh, like the actors and people who made this movie aren't out there. Like, Which again, we do support the WGA and SAG after strikes. We are not connected with studios. We're not doing any paid promotion. Just feel like I want to say that at every opportunity. Yes. Um, where was I going with that? Yeah, so like they weren't able to market this movie and maybe that kind of went into this this uh, opening weekend. But at the same time, this movie was originally made for streaming. Interesting. I didn't even know that. Yeah. So, like, when you think of a streaming quality movie compared to a theater release, typically there's a this pretty parody. big fall off between the two, you know, where streaming movies are fun and some of them are good, but most of them aren't on the same level. Uh, even when they put in a bunch of money. This definitely felt like a theater quality movie to me. I would agree. I didn't think I was watching. Like, I don't know at what Gray point Man. they, yeah, I don't know at what point they switched, but I'd imagine it was relatively close to when James Gunn and Peter Safran came in to take over and they're like, hey, we're losing a lot of money here. <laughs> you know, so I would imagine it's around that time. I think that's the, that was an excellent choice uh, because this is the first Latino superhero to get a live action full starring appearance. Mm -hmm. And that's an important thing. I, I think that to relegate that to being a streaming movie would have been a huge mistake. And this, I agree. this movie, like it really built on that. Like I, I, we said in our trail in our trailer reaction before blue beetle has a Hispanic director has a Hispanic star has a Hispanic writer like this movie's soundtrack has Hispanic music. This movie has a huge amount of Hispanic dialogue. Speak like the the grandmother in the movie only speaks Spanish. Um, so there's a good amount of subtitles in this movie, and it's it's cool because it's really true to that culture. And I think when movies lean into that, that's the the love that we're talking about. That like what we really appreciate in movies is when you infuse your culture into a movie it shows that you care. Like, it's like a piece of you is in your movie. Yeah, so that's what I like that. to see. Like, I like learning about culture, other cultures and stuff when I'm watching a movie. Yeah. It, doesn't, it, and, it doesn't matter what it is. I mean, if it's that you're Hispanic, if it's your religion, if it's maybe you really care about technology, and that's part of whatever you infuse into your movie, that love is what comes like through the camera to the audience, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, who, since we're talking about the creators and all this, let's go kind of in detail of who made this movie in front of and behind the camera. So we'll start with who was behind the camera. Our director for this movie is Angel Man Manuel Soto. Uh, the writer for this movie is Gareth Dunnett uh, Alcacer. And I apologize if I mispronounce any of these names. I'm going to do my best. Uh, the music is by The Haxon Cloak, um, which is a stage name. Um, but this is where I start to come into uh, something interesting that I noticed on IMDb, which is that um, this movie has a good amount of overlap 
with Ari Aster. So Ari Aster, obviously like a new big director in the horror industry, very well respected, um, has done a lot of work with A24, but the Hacks and Cloak is the music, has done the music for this movie and also did the music for the two most recent releases by Ari Aster, Bo's Afraid and Midsummer, And then cinematographer, uh, Paul, this, I hope I can pronounce this last name right, but uh, Pogazelski, Paul Pogazelski, uh, also did the most, the three most recent uh, cinematography for the three most recent Ari Aster movies, Bo's Afraid, Midsummer, and Hereditary. Um, and then uh, Paul also did cinematography for the movie Nobody, um, which is an action movie, which I think is probably what secured the confidence in him doing Blue Beetle because the action in this movie is filmed phenomenally, in my opinion. And Nobody, obviously, is a big action movie to have on your resume. And then the editing for this movie is done by Craig Alpert, uh, which just an interesting fun fact, I think, that so much alignment with the Ari Aster movies to show up in this movie and totally different style movie, the the horror genre. Yeah. Um, but the cat... It's really cool when all, like, the crew is familiar with each other. Exactly, yeah. And it, you'd have to imagine that that creates a better product. Yeah. You know, like, we talk about it before, how we think, like, when a writer is the director, like, there's just a understanding of how the story is supposed to be developed. But then when the crews all work together, you know, like, I... I understand like what you're going to do when I do this, yeah, you know, and vice versa to where you can make a product with this kind of unspoken communication yeah. in a way. And the comfortability of communication too can't be understated. If you want, if you have to go and talk with the editor and the cinematographer and sit down in a room and be like, all right, what kind of music do you want? What, how are we going to cut this? How's the music going to line up? That I, people maybe don't offhand recognize how, all these people have to work together because the music isn't just, they don't just finish the movie and then they're like, all right, pick some songs to line up with like that w would be impossible Yeah, to, to get it to line up as well as a feature film does. You have to ha be in communication with other departments. I feel like since we started this podcast, especially in the last few months, I've gained a new appreciation for how movies and shows and stuff are made. And I already was in this field, you know, I was already making videos, I was already working and making commercials and stuff. But like, just how often we talk about this of like, making a movie is really hard. Yeah, <laughs> it's really time consuming. It's really, really long days. You know, most of the time, it's 12 plus hour days back to back to back to back, you know, Tom Cruise says that he works seven days a week. You, you hear the rock all the time talking about how often he works like, that it's not just those main actors who are putting in all that work. There's so many other cast and crew that go into it. And the fact that making a movie is even possible is like mind blowing in itself, you know? And then you add in all the, the ego and uh, drama with like the studios. <laughs> like it's crazy. And that's how hard making a movie is not to say how hard making a good movie is. Like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, um, so then our cast is in front of the camera. We have the amazing Jola Maradueña as Blue Beetle slash Jaime Reyes. Where my Cobra Kai fans at? That's Miggy. Um, uh, Bruna uh, Marquezine as Jenny Cord. Becky G as Kaijida uh, or the Scarab. Melissa Escobeda, Escobedo as Milagro Reyes, the sister. Uh, Damien Alcazar as Alberto Reyes, the father. Excuse me. You're excused. Thank you. George Lopez, obviously. The incomparable George Lopez as Rudy Reyes, the uncle. Uh, Adriana Barraza as uh, Nana Reyes, uh, the grandmother. Uh, El Elpidia Carillo as, um, I hope I pronounced her name right, uh, the mother, Rocio Reyes. Uh, Susan Sarandon as Victoria Cord, uh, Harvey Guillen as Dr. Sanchez, Dr. Santos, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Misnamed, uh, and IMDb does have him credited as Dr. Sanchez, by the way. Yes. Uh, and Raul Max Trujillo as Carapax. And that is the bulk of our cast for Blue Beetle. I thought everybody did a really good job. Um, who was your favorite out of the cast? I got to go with Jaime Reyes. Um... How do you say his his name? Jaime? Yeah, no, how do you say his name? Oh, Joel Maradona. Yes. Uh, that. <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I liked him. I think he proved that he could be the lead in a big production movie. Yeah, You absolutely. know, like he was great in Cobra Cry. Like, uh, I haven't seen as much of it as you have, but I've seen the first two seasons, I believe. Um, and I, I really enjoyed him in that show. And it was cool to see him on the big screen. 
And I think it proves that he can like continue to do this even outside of Blue Beetle. I think you know? him and Bruna, who plays Jenny Cord, are in a relationship, by the way. Oh, really? Yeah, I've seen a, a few videos of them together on TikTok. And so I've seen some comments saying they're in a relationship. So I don't know to speak to the exact accuracy of that, but they, they seem like if they're not in a relationship, they seem like they're, they've become close friends. So he was her favorite, too. <laughs> <laughs> and vice versa. Um, How about you? Uh, I think it's hard not to say Jolo for this movie. I mean, there's a lot on him. He's like we talked about, he's the first Latino superhero to have his live action movie. And this movie is all centered around him. It's named Blue Beetle. Um, I think that he carried it really well. I think he's a phenomenal actor and I hope to see him in a lot more things like especially having the talents he has i mean the for one thing the ability to fluently speak spanish is like an awesome skill and opens you up to all kinds of different avenues for roles um but i i thought that when he was angry i i really believed it like i think it's really easy for someone like that young for it to come off really cheesy on screen when they're angry but um I think that he sold it really well when he was locked up at the end of the movie spoiler alert by the way we're gonna spoil the movie um <laughs> Or even when he was fighting at the end and his helmet was broken. Like, yeah. Gave me very invincible vibes, didn't yeah. it? When he wanted, and when he wanted, wanted to kill Carapax. Yeah. Like, I was very sold on his anger, and I think anger is one of the, like, rage like that is one of the harder emotions to sell without coming off as, like, corny, or, especially when you're a character that has to be nervous or anxious in other scenes mm -hmm. to do that well, to go from that to believably having rage and yeah. balance that, I think it shows a talent. But I also really liked his father. I thought... That oh, yeah. his father mm -hmm. tethered the film emotionally really well. And he was like, which I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like a lot of times in Hispanic stories, it's like a, a matriarchy. Um, so I feel like, but I feel like the father was more of the focus in this movie and the relationship between Jaime and his father. Because um, like, I mean, if, if you look at other really popular stories like Coco or um, what's We Don't Talk About Bruno? Um, with Maribel, and, oh, um, I don't know, the Casita, and <laughs> I, <laughs> but they're they're both focused on a matriarchy. So yeah. I feel like that was a little different for this movie to go that route. But like, I really resonated with me their relationship. I, I really enjoyed it. So I feel like the two of them for me were were the best part. And I surprisingly, my Susan Sarandon was like my least favorite, which she's a really talented actress. Yeah, she was the villain, right? Yeah, she played uh, the the Cord Victoria Cord, and I just feel like they wrote. There was a lot of really cheesy dialogue for her. Yeah, she was my least favorite by a lot. Yeah, it seemed like I just, I just feel like there was a missed opportunity where she could have been better and she could have been better utilized, especially the the caliber of actress she's in. I mean, she's been in a lot of she's done a lot of work. She's a huge body of work. Yeah, the list. I'm looking at her work history and it's just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. There's a lot of stuff on there for sure. But yeah, I, I didn't like the way that she was presented in the film. Um, and I, that's like my my biggest like uh, critique of the film would be kind of like the the villain and how that was all like portrayed. You know, it could have been a little bit more intense, a little bit more in depth, uh, and whatnot. But like I said, some of that corniness to her character, I think, was just the script. Like what I especially felt when Jaime was trying Jaime was trying to protect his family, and she's she just goes at one point shoot the family. She's like, kill the family. I was like, that's such an unbelievably villainous over the top thing for them to write into the script. Like he's fighting all that. She wants to see what he can do. So she's going to murder his entire family. Like it's like an old lady and a little, like a young 20 year old girl in included in that. It just seems like so over the top. Like, you know, when they try to make the villain overly villainous, just yeah. to prove a point, like, yeah, you, we get she's a bad guy. Like they were taking the family hostage and like destroying their house. Like it just doesn't completely make sense with her like character. She is the the figure of this big multi million billion dollar company, and she's just out there, relatively visible, sitting in this helicopter shooting up a family. Like that's clearly their helicopter, <laughs> you yeah. know? Like that. It just doesn't seem uh, strategic enough. And she's you know? like, she seemed to have a cartoonish amount of that level of involvement in atrocities. Like her walking through the jungle when they picked up Carapax in the flashback. She's like, <laughs> she's just always 
on the ground floor doing everything like the most heinous thing imaginable she's not like in an office somewhere somehow detached from it like a ceo would be right you know she's, she's like i want to get on the ground floor and murder families i want to see the look in the young man's eyes while I get well, you're right family. like it, it doesn't get her any closer to her goal it, 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 she's yeah. just doing it just because she's mean and she's supposed to be like so focused on this legacy of the chords but also simultaneously hates the chords for not recognizing her and casting her aside. So I'd get it if she was jealous of Jaime and she was like vengeful towards his family for like loving him the way she was never loved. But it just seems like such an overreaction in one direction for her to just kill them all. Right. Like is, is murder just mean nothing to her anymore? Is she that soulless? Like she was a, like a complete sociopath. Like yeah. that. And, and that wasn't like sold to me and sure like i get it some people are just bad because they're bad but like we didn't get any reason of like why she is like this malicious you know like like they gave, than, the, like, they gave the, the family business to her brother instead of her yeah so now she's off the deep end right like, into <laughs> like i get it that that would affect her mentally a lot but that's a big leap from there to murder the family yeah exactly <laughs> and everyone else that's she's already uh affected as well so we're kind of talking about this story already, and we like to rate our movies by breaking it down into six categories, the first of which being story. Uh, so what did you give this rating of the story for this movie out of 10? What did you give it? So I rated the story for this movie a 7 out of 10. Like we said at the beginning, I feel like nothing groundbreaking. Um, the story didn't hurt the movie or take me out of the movie, but the story didn't feel like it was anything new or fresh, which definitely can be hard to do. And not every movie has to be. So I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the focus on family. I always yeah. enjoy when that's a focus on the movie. And sometimes the, it's fun just to watch a different character go through a story that you've heard before. It's you're, like, yeah, you're right. It's a story we've heard before. Yeah. But yeah. Like you said, that's, that's totally fine. Um, I liked the fresh twists that they put on the same genre. Like, like we said, the infusion of culture, mm -hmm. um, the him, the nature between the father and the son was a great aspect of the story. The nature between uh, Blue Beetle and the villain was absent, in my opinion. I mean, it was just a dynamic between him and Carapax, really, um, rather than him and Victoria Cord. But the the scene at the end, what did you think of the scene where he sees his father? I thought it looked really cool with all the candles and the the... Their use of color in this movie is really great. I like the, the the background, the landscape of the sky where everything was just stars. So I enjoyed the, that emotional tether in that scene. What did you think about, about that? No, same. I felt the emotional impact of it. And that's part of the reason why we go to the movies and watch these shows is to go experience a, uh emotional story. Whether that motion is uh, sadness, uh, revenge, rage happy you know like there's a bunch of feelings that we as humans feel and it's good to go watch a movie where you feel a wide display of those um and i felt the emotional impact of that too um what did you end up rating it i rated the story at a 6.5 out of 10 so that's fair yeah right right where you were um like you said it nothing groundbreaking but i i had fun you what? know like it didn't deter me from enjoying the movie at all one thing that I thought was really corny was the way that when Blue Beetle was captured, his entire family was like, now we're going to turn into guerrilla warfare fighters and we're just going to take all these cord weapons and we're going to go fight an army of enhanced soldiers and save him. I was like, that's a little bit much like, especially when uh, Jaime himself is like nervous about fighting these people and doesn't want to. And he's in a bulletproof suit. Yeah. <laughs> and then you've got like his sister just pulling up with like a, a she slaps a wristwatch on and she's like, now I'm going to fight the army. Like it seemed like yeah. a little bit much, but that said, some of the biggest reactions in the theater I was in was to that. What I thought was corny. The biggest laughs in the movie were for uh, Abuela, for her, you know, communist fighting past or whatever it was for her, her like Viva la Rev Rev revolution past. Some of the biggest laughs in the movie were for her and for the sister and for that sequence of the, like the big uh, attack in the bug 
mobile where they they had the, <laughs> yeah. the bug fart sequence i I was a little confused of why they crashed it into the building. I thought they destroyed it. I was like, why would you do that? That's your only way out of here. That's a good complaint about the story for me is that Jaime was so focused, and they do this in a lot of movies, but Jaime was so focused on his morality and refusing to kill because we can't have our hero kill, right? Because that's the difference between a hero and a villain. But at the same time, on the other side of the coin... I mean, I'd beg to differ. Heroes can kill. (laughs) Check out here our Should Heroes Kill episode. But on the other side of the coin, everybody else in the movie was killing. So it's <laughs> right, like, like when you were uh, walking with the beetle yeah, and you like just impaled stabbed it, stabbed someone with the the claw or and the, whatever. And they're trying to shake it off. I was like thinking in my head, I was like, man, I guess no one else in his family cares. I guess Rudy about kills his grandma. <laughs> yeah, shot she, like thirty people. <laughs> she killed um, Milagro. She hit that guy with the fist. He flew like thirty feet. I'm sure he's dead. Uh, Bruno's character, Jenny Cord, she killed. Yeah, it like, definitely takes away from his like morality of I'm not gonna kill. And then at the end too, like he did kind of switch and like flip that switch kind of quick to going into that angered rage fight where he almost killed the villain. It was it was kind of quick, but I feel but like I, feel I like understand just, the the emotion behind yeah. it. His you know? father was killed, yeah. and then his uncle he yeah. thought was killed. So yeah. that's a lot in a day, right? Um, the but I it think, takes away from that when the rest of his family is just killing everyone. Yeah, that's yeah. What I see. For him, exactly. With no yeah. remorse for him to have that moral quandary about killing, and then everyone around him to just be <laughs> serving up murder on a platter is it's <laughs> in also, volume. Also, at the very end the climactic scene in the movie, he's sees that Carapax is about to have his um, redemption arc and Carapax is going to kill Victoria Cord. And he's like, watches him do it. It's like, where do you I know? I was, I was about to say like, is he going to stop him? Yeah. Or right. yeah. Nothing. If you're, if you're so violently against killing, isn't being a bystander and letting someone else commit murder, like too close. I, I don't know. It just seemed like, Movies really want to shoehorn that in, that the hero doesn't kill, for like this emotional weight to add to the story of, I can save everybody without killing, but at the same time, you're casting that aside, you know? Cause, but that said, it, it was awesome to see the, the giant uh, blue beetle scarab plane stab and pale the guy. It looks cool. Yeah. Um, I just think it's kind of... Uh, hypocritical i guess right in terms of the story no i agree i think that and the the villain dynamic is the two like weakest points of the movie but it's but it's you know the thing i said at the beginning too is like this is baseline like this is a superhero movie should have flaws a superhero movie it doesn't need to be oscar bait but it also shouldn't be complete trash you know right yeah so it's it's okay it can have flaws it's still good but like this should be the this should be the hole of where superhero movies tend to fall into. You sound like so reasonable today. <laughs> Are, is everything okay? Like it's with <laughs> you? Like normally I, you're like one end of the spectrum, you know? Like this movie is the best movie I have ever seen in my life. Or this movie is complete trash. This movie is shit. No one else is allowed to like this movie. Get out of my or I'm gonna shit. crap on them. <laughs> No, I, you're over here talking like reason and sense. That's how I feel like that's how middle of the road this movie had to fall. <laughs> Which it's it's middle of the road. I'm not trying to use that as an insult. It's like I think most movies should be good. That's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. So let's let's move on to the acting, acting in this movie. Yeah. Acting. Again, out of ten, I gave this a seven out of ten. I thought the acting was good enough to portray all the emotion. Um not nothing like groundbreaking kind of like the story you know like i I was debating between like a 6.5 to 7 but i feel like once you're in the sixes like into the fives you're you're kind of like this isn't very good and i think that would have been like kind of disrespectful like i think everyone played their part really well even if some of their parts were a little cheesy you know uh, they did it well. Yeah, we're we're starting to assimilate. We're, our ratings come out very close together nowadays in all our episodes. So I I gave it a seven point five. Nice. Um, and I thought that the acting in no way distracted from the story, but I thought in most instances the acting didn't particularly elevate the story either. Right. That's a very good way to put it. Um, I thought 
again uh that jolo and the the dad being the emotional like linchpin of the movie that they did the best elevating in the movie as far as the acting mm -hmm. goes um there wasn't much for them to give us from carapax or victoria cord or many of the other characters um berna as jenny had her emotional scene talking about her family which was sad but it's just all the elements weren't there for it to elevate like like i said earlier um i think that it was the people who were meant to be funny were funny. The the grandmother yep. was very funny. And Uncle Rudy, I, I said this leaving the movie that there's so many moments off screen where you hear a line still using the audio from George Lopez. I guarantee he was riffing. He was ad-libbing <laughs> all the time when they were filming and they picked their favorites and, and popped them in where they could to get as many of his good jokes in there as they could. Like the joke about, he's like, is that the new Tam Tamagotchi when the Blue Beetle the Scarab starts <laughs> to come to life? He's not on screen. Uh, he makes a joke when they're driving up to the Cord Mansion off screen. It's I think that they made good use of that because he probably had so many funny jokes. George Lopez is hilarious. Speaking of Rudy, did you did it stick out to you at all when they went down to the old Blue Beetle's base and he recognized Blue Beetle right away? But he didn't recognize that the his nephew or whatever is basically wearing the same. Like, did he not outfit? look at the like, symbol on his chest? Yeah, like those suits <laughs> looked pretty darn similar. The colors are exactly the same. Like, he seems like he was highly invested in that character of this hero, this figure. You know, like he knew his powers, he knew all the stuff. Like, but he didn't recognize it in his own living room. On his own nephew, yeah. like I would that part stuck out to me a little. I bit. would think he wouldn't respect his character; wouldn't respect Blue Beetle finding out that he was like a billionaire because he seemed very like anti-establishment, right? So it was kind. Of, I feel like that was maybe even a little out of character for him. That's the rest of that sequence too. But yeah. um, the that was a classic Blue Beetle suit. That is the comic drawing of Ted Cord's Blue Beetle suit, which is awesome. Always to see in movies when something's that accurate. Yeah. Um, our next category is cinematography. This was my favorite category. This is pretty much everything you see, like how you see it. So like how the, how the, how they set up the camera shots, the, like your favorite part of this category is like that camera movement. Like how did they use movement to, uh, elevate the story? Special uh, effects. Yep. That's yeah. where I was going to next. Uh, lighting as well. There's a lot of unique lighting in this movie. Walking, which it's a lot. Kind of like what we're doing now, which is. Uh, adding a little bit of flavor, a little bit of taste to the episode through lights. Um, yeah, so cinematography, I gave this an 8 out of 10. I really enjoyed it. I thought the lighting was great. I thought the camera movement was good. Um, the The fight scenes were really cool of how they displayed the action. They weren't cutting very often during the fights, which is nice to see. Um, yeah, I thought the cinematography was really good. What did you think? I also gave it an 8 out of 10. Okay, here we go. I, I dynamic think, duo yeah, right here. Yeah. I think that's it was potentially the best aspect of the movie, and uh, obviously we've got Powell doing the the cinematography. Who Midsummer is one of the most beautiful movies you'll ever watch. Mm -hmm. um, I think that he's a very talented cinematographer. Uh, the the action was filmed brilliantly, like you said. Yep. That was my favorite sequences in the movie. The they had an obligatory hallway fight scene that everything inserts now because Daredevil made it popular. Um, but the lighting in that scene was a little dark. I understand the reasoning for it because um, throughout the movie, the suit looks goddamn fantastic. So there are probably areas where they had to decrease visibility to yeah. keep when, special. When things are a little bit darker, you can hide things, especially when there's a CG character involved or special effects being involved. Like his suit was practical, but they had special effects elements on the suit to enhance it, uh, especially like when he's you know, creating a sword in from his arm, you know, yeah. like obviously that's not practical. Yeah, uh, the special effects extent. were really good. Like yeah. when you speak of that sword and and basically that nanotechnology esque look of the the transformation of the suit, it always looked great throughout you, the movie. Even the simple things like the little shield and stuff, like that stuff looked really good. The the beetle itself, that big huge uh, ship yeah. that we were referencing earlier, like that looked really good. It looked like it was actually crashing into that building for no reason. I thought throughout, through and through, the special effects for this movie were absolutely phenomenal. Some of the best I've seen all year. And the only thing that I didn't like was the exterior shot of the Cord's old mansion because mm. it, it looked entirely fake. Um, and the flamingos in front of the house looked yeah. The flamingos CGI. didn't need to be there. They, exactly. They yeah. not necessary. They didn't elevate anything. They didn't give you more context of where they were. They didn't. It 
they're pointless. They did not need to be there. It literally just made me think, oh, that's not real, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but the, the practical suit looked freaking awesome. And there's yeah. to name a few shots in this movie that I really liked him everywhere. He's flying through the air, especially the movement of um, him flying alongside the bridge looked really good. The camera just tracking with him kind of, you know, panning to the side that he looked so good flying through the air. It looked very realistic, like the bridge and him both had the look like they were in the same physical location. Um, the shots of him flying through the city, the shots of him in the atmosphere with the earth or underneath him, stunning. I think the most beautiful shot in the whole movie, the earth looks so good in that sequence. The shots in the dreamscape where after he talks to his father, I already talked about how beautiful the space looks there. And then just the, the way the action is filmed, like you said, with some of the longer shots and then the blocking, the, the, um, choreography, fight choreography, where he's just doing flips. And I don't want to see my hero here just shoot blasts out of their hands. Like they had Blue Beetle fight. And so they filmed mm -hmm. that action really, really well. Like him catching the missile, him punching that guy in the air and then kicking him against the wall. Like they, they filmed it. And then the lighting in this movie was probably my favorite thing about the actual cinematography because they maintained a color theme, which is my favorite thing. Um, one of my favorite things. I say everything's my favorite thing. <laughs> But they maintain the color theme of the blue and purple right. and also kind of this theme of retro, which I saw in the font of the title, but I didn't realize how much it was going to be infused in this movie. Like the cord watch, talking about Tamagotchis, the, um, what would you call those? The arcade games and all the tech that's in cords like basement, all that retro stuff was just so cool of a theme. And I feel like the neon lighting of the blue and purple fed to that retro theme as well. And then they also used the theme of red for the villain. Very basic theme, but to me, like... It, it looks cool. Yeah, to me, like, it does. foundational, maybe, is a better word than basic, because it's, like, I think the best way to do it is, like, red is the villain, blue is the hero. When you see them flying through the air fighting, like, they're red versus blue. It's The dichotomy is very present in the color scheme, very obvious. Mm -hmm. And I thought that... Damn it, if it just didn't look so good. The red, the blues, and the purples in the whole movie. Something that you didn't mention is the the transformation getting into the suit looked really cool. It was like it was burning onto his body. It was like yeah. volcanic looking. Yeah, it was cool. I do think sometimes the suit looked a little fake, um, but I think most of the time it looked really good. You could tell in some instances, maybe when they're further away, like when they're close up, you can see like the... Scarab on his back is Blue Beetle. Like you can see practically that it's like probably a plastic. Right. Um, but maybe at some of the wider angles where they thought they could get away with it, you know, there's a little bit more CGI trickery. Yeah. Um, very well done. And our next category is sound design. Again, out of 10. I gave this an 8 out of 10. I thought the, the like Blue Beetle track was really cool with that little hit that they have. I love it when superheroes or your hero has like this specific chord or, or hit that like happens when he does something really cool, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I like the music in here. The sound effects were really good. Uh, so I gave it an eight out of 10. What did you give it? I gave it a seven out of 10 and I didn't feel like there was anything too much about the music that I particularly noticed other than the use of Spanish music, mm. which again, that cultural infusion, I feel like helped elevate the movie. Every time they use, especially at the end, there was a, a Spanish song at the end that was kind of like when they were fighting in the hallway, that was a little bit more upbeat and the tempo like really kept you exhilarated with the fight. I feel like that infusion was the best part to me about the the sound design and the score. But as far as like the actual sound effects, the only one I can like recall off my head is again from the trailer of the sword dragging across the ground, which is <laughs> so good. Yeah. The sword on the asphalt. No, I think it had like when he is transforming or like when he like got launched onto the roof and stuff, just the impact of that, everything was really loud and like it, it drawed me into the moment. And I think that's what good sound design does. They captured overlapping voices a lot, which is like something anybody can identify with that comes from a house with like multiple people in it. Like if you're in a household or you have, you have a couple siblings, like people don't wait for each other to finish their sentence. I have a podcast <laughs> with a host who never stops talking, <laughs> but that, that they captured really well with the audio and the mix is yeah. just all the family members in the household speaking back and forth over each other. Our next category is set and character design. This is out of five points. Now this is different than cinematography because this is like the decisions behind what you see. 
not necessarily how you're seeing it. So uh, how did how did the suits look? How did uh, you know they're just their regular clothes look? How did the the buildings that they were in look? The landscapes, like the actual sets that they're on, whether they're real or CG. Um, how did that stuff look? I gave this a 2.5 out of five. Um, and the reason for that, I, I, it's kind of low, but the reason for that is for me, the villain felt very basic. Oh, I hated his suit. Um, hated it. Like it, it looks good, but it looks like I've seen it a thousand times before, you know, like it, there was nothing like new about it to me you know like it, yeah. it seemed like an afterthought like they spent a lot of time on blue beetle yeah. himself he looked awesome i loved how the the legs were hanging out the whole time like and that they didn't just like go away like and hide and you just kind of see the silhouette of a person but like you see the silhouette of blue beetle and you know that's blue beetle i really liked the colors of the suits and stuff uh but i feel like the the villain itself and then also like and it, this kind of goes in the story a little bit as well but where we see all those attachments in that like little cave or whatever, and it's like they have hundreds of these. One that like didn't scare me at all, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but two, like <laughs> I feel like it didn't look that good in, in terms of like a design. Like it physically looked good, like it was well made. But I don't know, just this huge thing on the back of the neck. Like seen it before. It wasn't elegant. You know, like you, you get kind of get where I'm going. Yeah, no, um, I totally agree. I think what you're saying is that, and I agree if this is the case, I, it looked real enough. Right. It looked good. Yes. But it just didn't look cool. Cool. Yes. Yeah, cause no, you know, that's look, exactly it. Carapax looked like a freak. Like he looked like Megatron, like that's, which is cool for Megatron, Yes, but it's not cool for him. Right. In my opinion. Yeah. There was nothing different. He was just a mix of like a uh, power Ranger, Iron Man, Power Ranger. Yeah. Yeah. He looked like an amalgamation of those things. Like which, if you saw his silhouette, you would have no idea who he is. Be like robot thing. Yeah. But that's the thing though, is like Pacific Rim, the, that giant suit, it looks like Pacific Rim when I look right. at it. Iron Man looks like Iron Man. His suit yeah. looked like... Megatron his, looks like Megatron. His suit looked like if you took a scraps of ideas from those things and like... And like... Yeah. It looks like the first draft. Yeah. Like you said, it definitely does look like an afterthought. Blue Beetle's suit looks like there was like a first, second, third, 20th draft and they're like, this is perfection. Yes. It looks phenomenal. Yes. That's why I gave the score a 3.5 because I think the movie is fighting itself. I think the movie... Is Blue Beetles way up here? <laughs> Palmera City's way up here. I think yeah. Palmera City looks awesome. The fact that they decided to give Blue Beetle his own city to give, because they talk about this in an interview. Like originally, Blue Beetle, everyone might not know this, he's from El Paso, Texas, but they thought Batman has Gotham, Superman has Metropolis. Let's give Blue Beetle Palmera City. Let's give him his own city. So they created a fictional city and they made it look really cool. This giant yeah, futuristic city with skyscrapers. You can see the world of progress, the world of tomorrow. And then you can see the struggle on the other side of yeah. the tracks, basically. So I, I definitely thought, see where you're coming from with giving it a 3.5 opposed to my 2.5. I feel like maybe just the the lackluster villain and and how that was all presented is what's like kind of kicking it down yeah because yeah. that's what i'm saying is when i say it's fighting itself it's like blue beetles up here palmera city's up here ted cord's basement the design of like the retro and the yeah the lights down there yeah. the, the the adding in like the, the the retro ted cord watch is like a set piece the the scarab itself looks awesome they mm -hmm. they had a belly a belly burger in there like that's an yeah. iconic fast food restaurant what did that DC watch world do uh, I think it like helped. It was like the key. She said it opened the, it the door opened down the door? to the Ted okay. Cord Batcave. But that that Ted Cord Batcave looked awesome. I really liked the retro infusion yeah. of the arcade games and everything and all the tech in there. But it's the movie's kicking itself in the nuts <laughs> yeah. when it shows us because outside a of, lot of times the in really good movies, especially superhero movies that like really stick out it's because of the villain the villain was really cool really compelling and that's what this movie is missing on yeah. all aspects in basically every one of these categories you well, know like, even, even the villainous base that you mentioned with the the suits stacked to the, like that entire the rest of that place too was just derivative like it was yeah. like it was like a like castle villain. Also, like, like if this is world. in the world that Batman and Superman are in, like, why isn't this like a bigger deal? Like, she's creating a military army. 
that's out of yeah. humans. That's a consistent like, complaint for Superman. Why isn't so, yeah. why isn't like Batman involved in this? Yeah, you know, that's, like, that's always going to be the case yeah. for these movies. That's like something it, they it can doesn't fight. have to be like that though. Yeah. You know, like you could have a someone who's really rich that's not necessarily trying to equip everyone with this high tech military piece of equipment. Yeah, you, you can know, like it. yeah, it can be something that's smaller that's still very villainous that a hero would be needed to stop. You know, I mean, that's kind of what specifically what they did with Spider-Man Homecoming. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a developing a street level villain. Right. Um, but that closes out our sound design or our set and character design. But I'm really interested to know what you have for the rewatchability because this is an important category in your eyes. Yeah, I really like this one. So basically, if you were to ask someone five times, how many times did you watch this movie? Um, I would say three. Like I, I'm. I'm fine with watching it, you know. I think it's, it's a good time. Like, yeah, you've given it was some fun. low scores, but it's a good time. Yeah, I also watched this movie. So I went and saw it in theaters last night, late last night, in preparation for this episode. And it was just me and my sister and her friend in there, and one other guy. So like, it was, it wasn't the like crowd experience, yeah. you know, that you hope to get out of the theater experience, you know. So like, I would be willing to watch this again with other people to kind of get more of that feeling of like, oh, how is Andrew reacting to this part? Or like, oh, I want to tell someone this when I see something yeah. on screen. Like my theater was Saturday night. So we had a bunch of people, people were laughing. Like, yeah. It was relatively full. Yeah. Um, I also see this being like a good movie to kind of put on in the background, you know, like where it's really cool to like stop and watch some of the pieces to it, but I don't necessarily need to yeah. pay attention to the whole movie again. There's like four pretty big fight sequences. That's a yeah. decent amount. Like at the same time though, it was a little bit of slow in terms of like, we didn't really get to see a lot of Blue Beetle, you know, which is kind of my biggest critique of origin. maybe all origin movies, you know, like you just don't, because they have to have time to develop like how this character came to be. Um, but it, it kind of took a while. He's not Blue Beetle until the second act of the movie. Right. So, I mean, and even then, like it's, it, you don't see it a ton either. Uh, but what we did see, very good. Yeah. I yeah. love the suit. I love the action. I so I ended up giving the movie a two point five out of five for rewatchability. Oh, like right, right around, right the around the same yeah. score. Half the time, half the time you asked me to watch it because yeah. I don't feel like it's anything that I need to come back to over and over again. But if you're asking me if I'm if I want to yeah. watch it, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's a Throw fun it movie to watch. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not doing anything right now. <laughs> what did your total score come out to? Came out to a seven out of ten. And mine, a seven point one. Yeah, this this is what I like about our like ranking system is takes the bias out and because i thought like maybe a seven out of ten is a little high you know but mm -hmm. objectively like this is where i rank the movie you know and i i think that a seven out of ten is is good you know for this movie it, it's accurate of where i think it should be but maybe originally if you would have just asked me without doing these categories i would say something a little lower than a seven uh <laughs> We're all, Andrew's getting distracted here. Can you please <laughs> put that away? Focus, Andrew, it's focus. The, it's for the theme. Focus. It's retro. <laughs> it's focus. Uh, but we, we had a very close score. Yeah. I think that like a seven out of 10 in reality, it stands above most movies ever made. Like if you think about it. By far. Most of the movies that people have seen, people tend to see movies that are good. So mm -hmm. I probably tend to see movies that are at least a seven. The average person isn't gonna just like watch every movie that's yeah, but like how you, many movies are on Netflix? But if you look at the body of all movies ever made, most of them have to fall below a six. Yeah. So that that's just something I think people don't tend to account for and maybe tend like I personally tend to see seven as like not the best score. But that's not, you know, that's not but today true. you're very reasonable. I'm in a reasonable mood today. Yeah. So like you're you're seeing it with how it is. I might not see it know? like this tomorrow. Yeah. Um <laughs> But yeah, I think Worst that movie ever. Uh, I am surprised that we rated it so close. Um, based on hearing your ratings like throughout, I thought your total was going to come out to a bit lower than mine. But I guess we were pretty we were actually pretty close. Yeah. Um, our last segment of today is a segment that we call source code. And this is where we go over the original source material for whatever topic we're talking about. And in this case, that is Blue Beetle, which was originally a comic. Um so, Andrew, <laughs> take it away. Take it away. So if you didn't know, Blue Beetle was originally a comic book. There have been 
three main individuals to carry the mantle of Blue Beetle. Uh, starting with his original appearance in 1939, it was Dan Garrett. Dan Garrett was an archaeologist who discovered the scarab in Egypt, um, where it grafted onto him and he became the first Blue Beetle. The second person to carry the mantle was mentioned in the film Blue Beetle, Ted Cord. He was not able to have the Blue Beetle grafted onto him because, like they mentioned again in the film, the scarab only chooses a particular host. It's not going to form a bond or relationship with just everybody. So Ted Cord is a billionaire genius. Uh, he is similar to, I would say, Tony Stark, but he develops his own tech and becomes the Blue Beetle using his his cunning, his intelligence to develop tech. Um, Which is shown in the movie. Shown in the movie as yep. well. That's the He's the father of Jenny Cord, who is the main love interest in the film. So... Ted Cord fights crime um, using his own tech inspired by the Scarab. And then in comics, we get Jaime Reyes. Jaime is a teenager in high school. He lives in El Paso, Texas. Um, one day, the Scarab happens upon him, which to give you the comic book details, uh, the Scarab is brought to the Rock of Eternity. The Rock of Eternity is destroyed in a skirmish between Shazam and the Spectre. And it sends all the objects in the Rock of Eternity sh shooting out across the, the world, across the galaxy. Uh, the Scarab itself, or who's also known as Kaijida, arrives in El Paso, Texas, where Jaime finds it on his way home from school. He brings it home, and then eventually it grafts onto his body, giving him the powers of the Blue Beetle. Now, you might wonder, how did Kaijida end up on Earth? Who created it? Where did it come from? What is Kaijida's origin? I can explain that really quickly for you. Uh, Kaijida is a piece of sentient technology created by an alien race known as the Reach. The Reach is kind of this villainous race that's in contention with um, the... I don't. I want to get this right because I messed this up on a past episode. Mess up uh, the, the Guardians, the Lantern Corps. So... The the technology itself is created by the Reach. They had intended for it to be this um, insurgent piece of AI that would fly to an, an Earth and secretly conquer that Earth. So basically, uh, Kaiju is meant to take over a host. The Scarab would find a host and then imbue them with world-destroying powers. That host would then take over that planet, and that planet would become kind of like a conquested military outpost of the Reach civilization. Um, in the travels of this specific scarab, that it becomes damaged, and the damage allows it the damage makes it unable to fully take over the host. So Kajida then ends up arriving on Earth, and through all these series of events that I've described, she ends up in the hands of Jaime Reyes, but no longer able to fully control the host. There's now this back and forth relationship between the Scarab and the host, where there's kind of a partial control that we see in the movie. In the movie, Kajida at the end is able to stop Jaime from doing something he would regret in killing a person because Kajida does have control of the suit, of the body in a way, but Jaime also has control of the body. And we to see the relationship in comics tends to be more strained, whereas the Scarab wants to initially always act with aggression towards the slightest uh, provocation, but Jaime is more reserved and, and doesn't want to do that. Jaime is not as quick to action, as quick to offense and violence. So this dynamic proceeds. But by the end of the movie, we actually get this cool relationship between Jaime and the Scarab where they actually seem to have a bond and they seem to agree that they're not killers, that they want to be good people. So we'll see where that goes in the story of DC. It seems like Jolo is going to continue as Blue Beetle. So we'll see how that relationship develops because it's is already he? quite, that's what I've heard. So it, that's already quite different from the comics because the Scarab continues on and on in everything I've seen to which this is not from a comic book perspective. I have not read Blue Beetle. So in everything animated that I've seen, the Scarab has this aggressive personality that mm -hmm. persists. But they seem to be in alignment now in the movie, which is cool. Which do you prefer? I like the movie because we've seen them, we've seen the warring personalities already with Venom and um, as, and other characters, like, like Moon Knight has a warring personality. So because they're sharing the same mind, for them to come to the same conclusion is actually more interesting and fresh from my perspective. What about you? Uh, so I haven't really seen any of the animated shows with Blue Beetle in it. So to me, that sounds more interesting where they're at conflict more often. Than I, I feel like we already get that with like the Hulk and, and Venom and, and some other Moon Knight, some of the other personalities. Yeah, but all of those 
that you mentioned are in the Marvel universe. That's true. You know, so like to have something like that in the DC universe, even though it is a similar story, it'd be cool to see a different spin on it. You know, like we were talking about earlier, just because it's a story you've heard before, it doesn't mean that it can't be an interesting one. Yeah. Um, so I, I like the kind of internal conflict, like going back and forth, you know, so maybe they'll, they'll bring that back a little bit, you know, to where like, yeah, they're mostly in agreements, but at times they, they but, clash, yeah. you know, which that would make sense. Well, there's also a storyline where, uh, the, the scarabs reactivated to its original purpose. So they could, mm. they could butt heads in that sense as well. If the scarab then wants to take him over and then Dr. Fate and someone else, I think in that storyline has to give Jaime back control. But Jaime himself, I do want to mention, has his first appearance only in 2006. So he first appears in Infinite Crisis number three in February 2006. Um, and he's been a member of a bunch of teams, uh, including most notably the Teen Titans. Uh, but I also believe we've seen him on, on the Justice League as well. Uh, I think that he is a really cool addition to the DC. And that this is the specific version of Blue Beetle I would have wanted them to go with. Out of the three that I described, he's my favorite. Uh is this a part of the new DCU? Yes. That's that's the what is the word on the street is that Jolo is, that, is the, it actually though because we also got all of those rumors that Gal Gadot is coming back as Wonder Woman the, which I don't think is true. The phrasing which I believe to be straight out of James Gunn's mouth is that Superman is the first movie of the new DCU but Blue Beetle is the first character of the new DCU. So does that mean this movie doesn't count? I think way? I think this this movie still counts, but I think Superman is kicking off the DCU. I think it's like maybe chronologically first, or just like symbolically starting the new DCU. But that this character's presence and I think this movie still happened because if you notice, they didn't include anything overly specific or overtly identifying with like the Snyder universe or yeah. the DCEU. It's it's. They mentioned the existence of Batman. They, I believe they mentioned Superman. the existence of Superman. He's got the Gotham Law hoodie. I think there's a LexCorp logo that can be seen on the Palmera skyline. Um, the Gotham Law hoodie is awesome, by the way. I've seen, I've seen Jolo wearing it on TikTok, like just out <laughs> in the world. Like I've, he, he, ha, he owns that hoodie yeah. and wears it. I, I would buy it. It's his. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I think that's my understanding. Everything's really difficult to understand right now. So I understand. Yeah confusion i'm confused for sure on it so yeah. i understand confusion hopefully in the next two years or so that all kind of be ironed out and we'll have a better understanding of like where this universe is going but the future seems bright yeah you know especially if they keep blue beetle which i think they definitely should uh it's a good a good member of the team an interesting character that i want to see more of uh especially interacting with other characters that we know like batman superman and all that um Anything else you want to add to our Blue Beetle review? Well, I'm sure I'll remember something I want to add once we turn off the camera. That's always the case. Right? <laughs> like It's like, oh, man, I really wanted to bring up this. Or did you remember that part from the movie? Um, but anyways, thank you, everyone, for listening, especially if you made it this far. We appreciate you watching the whole episode. It's crazy that you want to hear us talk for that long. Um, we have merch. We have shirts, like we mentioned in the beginning of the episode. We have two different colors we have the yellow original which is what i'm wearing now which doesn't really look yellow but it is and then we also have a black shirt that is uh for sale as well that we have ordered ourselves and it's on its way uh so i'm excited to get that um again we're almost at 500 subscribers on youtube so please check us out there we post new full episodes every monday and thursday on youtube spotify apple Podcasts, everywhere you get your podcasts we're posting every single day on all the social medias tiktok instagram facebook youtube shorts so you can check us out there and interact with us there uh thank you so much for all the support and, and that's, that's a wrap, wrap.